Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having me this morning. Um, what an amazing location to be at as well. It's beautiful outside. Um, look, I just really wanted to share today a little bit around the ATO's current approach um, with regards to debt recovery, uh, what that looks like in terms of perhaps uh, the construction industry generally, uh, and a little bit around what that um, experience is in a more detailed sense with regards to the actions being undertaken and also why we're undertaking those actions. Um, so really glad to speak to um, organisations such as this one where we do want to promote and be as transparent as possible with regards to the actions that the ATO undertakes. I don't think it would be any surprise to anyone that um, the ATO's role is really around effectively administering tax super and registry systems. Um, I think one of the uh, elements that we have been grappling with more recently in terms of our core function is that of how we can undertake activity that essentially protects not just the revenue that is used for community services that we all benefit from, but also how do we protect businesses from getting into a position where they're accumulating debt to the extent that they can't recover. Um, also protecting employees with regards to entitlements that aren't being paid by employers and protecting other businesses that uh, may be at risk in terms of trading with those businesses that are in a debt position. So a lot of our approach is really fundamentally on the basis of how do we act in terms of our role to undertake that kind of protector position more broadly. Um, we do consider it important that we make it fair for business owners who do the right thing. So the majority of taxes owed are paid on time, about 90%, in fact, of all liabilities owed are paid on time. So that's an incredible outcome. Um, certainly when you look across other countries, uh, Australia does pretty well in terms of that active compliance from a taxpayer perspective. Um, we do look at opportunities to assist businesses as soon as possible before they get to a position that, as I said, they can't recover from. And our fundamental position is to take actions as best we can to prevent debt from accumulating in the first instance. It's one of the reasons that we do take quite a bit of effort in terms of all of our pre-due date activities. That might be SMS reminders and those sorts of things. But it's also about how we um, design and deliver our online services that do make it easier for people to comply. About 70% of unpaid tax is self-assessed. So the majority of it is pretty visible to taxpayers in the first instance. They've actually told us that's what they owe. Um, but obviously we do undertake to ensure that they're reminded as to when it's actually due and payable as well. Um, so our approach, as I mentioned, really comes under four categories. Um, it's not linear. So even though it's presented on the slide as four boxes side by side, um, we do take a risk-based approach with regards to the activities that we undertake. We do consider previous behaviours from a taxpayer. So it's not the case that every time we'll go through all four stages um, in that order. If we can see that there is greater risk and we need to do more to disrupt um, non-compliant behaviour, then we may take some of those firmer and legal recovery actions a lot sooner as opposed to give everyone time to respond to earlier interactions when in fact we know they're unlikely to respond or engage in, in relation to those. Um, so largely, as I said, we spend a lot of time and effort on prevention. Um, we do then look to help and assist businesses. I think over the last 12 to 18 months, it's been really clear the ATO's expectation <coughs> is that businesses contact us before we contact them. So we are looking for taxpayers who know they're going to be in trouble, who know they're not in a position to meet their obligations on time, to actually take steps and proactively contact the ATO. Um, rather than wait for us. And there are more support options and more things that we can do in the instance that that activity is taken a lot sooner. Um, we will, however, progress to recovery actions um, and we are returned pretty much to normal following what was a fairly lenient approach and essentially a pause during COVID. So that does include a reintroduction of our efforts to do garnishes. Directed penalty notices have uh, considerably increased the disclosure of tax debts to credit reporting bureaus is also something that has been happening quite often. Um, and in some instances, uh, we are able to take steps to um, things like direction to pay for super guarantee charge. Um, that one's not used as often just by the nature of it, which is that we need to undertake all activities first. 
and we can't do a direction to pay if a business is insolvent. Um, so it's very rare that that one is, is used, but it is available to us. Um, and then in those instances where we still see no response, then we will progress through to legal recovery. Um, that does include departure prohibition orders, so preventing people from leaving the country where they have unpaid debts, um, summons or claims, bankruptcy notices, creditors' positions, all the way through to wind up activity. Um, what I will say, and we'll get into this in a little bit of detail, is I know there's been a lot of media attention around the activity and the increase of that being much greater than pre-COVID. Um, certainly from an ATO perspective, our actions are just back to pre-COVID numbers. Um, and overall, as a, a, as a portion of the total businesses registered, um, the portion of insolvencies has not really increased over um, the time pre-COVID and all the way back through to GFC. So there is certainly an increase in activity. It does look like it's escalated and it has when compared to COVID. Um, we're probably expecting it to continue to inc increase because we do think that there is a little bit of a balancing that is still to occur. Um, but we're certainly not yet even in some of those actions back to where we were pre-COVID. Um, why are we doing this? Uh, so again, I think pretty well reported, uh, the growth in collectible debt has been quite considerable. When you look at a pre-COVID debt book of around about $25.6 billion, um, we're almost double that at the moment. Um, it's probably come down a little from the $51.4 billion at the end of March. I think we're back around $50 billion at the moment. Um, and as you can see, the predominant contributors to unpaid tax and super is in the small business market um, and also private and wealthy groups. So most of the unpaid tax and super is owed by business um, and a large portion, about 25 billion of the 34.3 billion owed by small business um, is activity statement debt. Um, so that is pays to go withholding that's been withheld on behalf of employers and GST outstanding. Um, there's about 1.9 billion of employee super that is unpaid um, and about 80, 90% of that is also owed by small business. So whilst the ATO doesn't particularly target any industry groups, you can understand that our response and recovery actions are proportionate to the contribution that's being made to, to that debt book. Um, so I think that uh, often surprises people. We often hear that the ATO's efforts really need to be in the larger end of town. So when we talk about PMB, that's our public and multinational businesses. Um, in fact, most of the debt, um, most of the liabilities owed by public and multinational businesses are paid on time. About um, between 65 and 70% of the liabilities owed by small businesses are paid on time. So there is quite a significant increase. Um, we do expect that a portion of the 34.3 billion owed by small businesses is owed um, by businesses that aren't viable or potentially trading insolvent or are actually not trading at all, but just haven't let us know. Um, so whilst we currently reflect that as collectible debt, there's probably a bit of work that we will undertake in terms of our recovery actions that is likely to flush out what is actually insolvent debt in that debt book as well. Um, from a construction industry perspective, um, we don't normally publish uh, specific industry debt details, um, but we do see uh, a considerable contribution from the construction industry uh, I don't suspect that will be a surprise to most people. Um, we have seen quite a few pressures in the industry. Uh, again, we don't have a strategy from a debt collection perspective that targets the construction industry, but given they contribute over 20% of the collectible debt, again, there'll be a proportionate impact through the construction industry with regards to that activity. Um, probably what we do see in the construction industry is um, that when they're in trouble, they, there's not a lot they can do in terms of recovery. So we know they run a kind of fine line in terms of how they manage cash flow and assets and things like that. And so we do see quite a considerable impact when they start to get in trouble. Um, I think businesses in general, what we see 
particularly if you think about trade debtor cycles and things like that. Um, anything that remains overdue around 90 days is probably worrying from our perspective. Um, if you think about businesses that are in a quarterly cycle, 90 days and their next liability becomes due through the quarterly BAS. Um, so our actions moving forward are really looking at ways for us to uh, take steps to assist and support businesses before they get to that point of 90 days of outstanding amounts. Um, because we know that even in a payment plan, over time, the ability for them to maintain a payment plan really reduces because they just can't maintain their current debts as well as the ones that they're trying to recover from historically. Um, I can or I can do it at the end. I'm happy either way. Um, considering what some might say is how hard you've gone in the last year in regards to collections, are you surprised or in, I know it's only very marginal, but the, the debt is still increasing? Um, look, it's not surprising that it is increasing. So ordinarily, debt increases every year. So um, that's nothing new. The debt book, if you look at it over time, increases largely aligned with economic conditions. What we've seen is a slowing of the growth of it. Um, so it, at its peak in terms of growth, collectible debt overall was growing around 22% per annum, which is massive. Um, we've now got it back down to around 2 to 5% growth. Um, so it's certainly, yeah, it, even when you look at the 22, 23, 23, 24 on this one, um, it's, it's starting to slow down in terms of that growth. I think it is going to be a challenge for us to see the debt actually start to reduce, but it is something that we need to see happen. Um, I think if you think about the economy more broadly and inflation, $50 billion that should actually have been paid through taxes but is otherwise sitting where it shouldn't be, um, you know, I think that's going to have an impact. And so I think the community expects and it is our role to undertake those actions, absolutely. Um, just a little bit around director penalty notices. You might all be quite familiar with these. Um, it has been an area that the ATO has increased in terms of activity considerably. Um, DPNs are issued to directors of companies uh, where they have unpaid pays you go withholding, GST or employee super debts. Um, once DPNs have issued, directors have 21 days to respond and take action to either pay the liability or take steps in some instances to um, look at the financial viability of the company um, before we then commence or recommence um, taking recovery action on the director. So it does put their personal assets at risk. Um, importantly, directors are liable for company debts before the DPN. The DPN is really the notice that provides for the ATO to put the debt on their personal account and to take recovery action in response to that. Um, so that may include then progressing through to actions such as garnishes on the director. It also ensures that as soon as the debt um, director penalty is put on the director account, that any refunds they may be entitled to through their own lodgements will be used to reduce those debts as well. So it does have quite an impact um, and it is important for directors in that position to really reach out as soon as possible, put in a payment plan for the company, take the necessary steps to engage. Um, if a director is engaging with us or a company is engaging with us with those debts, we're unlikely to progress through to a DPN if that engagement is effective. Um, so as you can see, uh, certainly as I mentioned, the number of DPNs that have been <coughs> issued uh, has increased considerably. Very few were done during COVID period. Um, it is absolutely one of our core processes. Um, we do have high expectations of directors as companies. Um, one of the other things I'll note that we are moving towards is there are directors who are directors of multiple companies. Previously, we've issued DPNs individually as we progress recovery action on the company. We are now moving to an approach that means that if you're a director of multiple companies, 
you'll get a DPN for the entire debt owed by all the companies all at once. So that does start to look at the increased risk that that director poses to us where we see a habit or a behaviour forming in relation to the entities that they are responsible for. Um, and those director penalties become a parallel liability across all the directors of the company um, and the recovery action undertaken is proportionate to that as well. Um, Garnishy notices, uh, something that again really paused except for um, very concerning behaviour during COVID. Uh, we still haven't got to anywhere near the number of garnishes that we were issuing pre-COVID. So I think to the end of last year, there was something like um, a few thousand garnishy notices um, issued pre-COVID, we were doing tens of thousands of garnishy notices. So um, we do expect that we will start to see a further increase in terms of the number of garnishes that we are issuing. Um, the ATO does have a number of guardrails, if you like, to ensure the appropriate issuing of garnishes. Um, and there are processes and procedures that are appropriate to reflecting the impact a garnishy notice can have on a taxpayer. Um, essentially, we'll consider a garnishy notice if we see the taxpayers are unwilling to work with us or they haven't responded to our previous engagement attempts. Um, if there's been repeated defaults on agreed payment plans, um, so that sort of gives us a sense that it's not a true and effective engagement, they're just trying to postpone things. Um, if obviously there's no steps to resolve the tax debt before it starts to escalate, um, really, if there's been an audit and the audit has identified some more concerning or egregious behaviour of avoidance and things like that, we may take steps to immediately do a garnishy. Um, and uh, obviously where we see Phoenix activities, um, we also probably are more likely to do a garnishy where we see outstanding amounts of superannuation. So we certainly have a lower tolerance with regards to unpaid super than other types of, of tax debts. Uh, disclosure of business tax debts is another one. Um, so in 2020, I think it was, the government introduced legislation that allowed the ATO to report to credit reporting bureaus um, outstanding amounts of tax where they had accumulated over a period of at least 90 days and were over $100,000 in value um, for taxpayers with an ABN and where that debt wasn't disputed or currently under an active complaint with the Inspector General of Taxation. Um, the ATO has undertaken to really improve the process of disclosing business tax debts. Again, we see that it is incredibly important that there's visibility and transparency to other businesses in making decisions about the activities and the trading relationships that they have with other businesses. And so we do think that it's a really important step. Um, we do also see some pretty good outcomes in terms of just issuing a notice to many businesses with the intent to disclose. Um, so we do see that that engages um, taxpayers where previous activity hasn't. Um, and uh, I, I think certainly we see it as quite an effective measure. Um, it does mean now that not paying your tax, uh, tax debts um, can impact your credit rating, which is probably quite a considerable shift than before we had this measure in place. Um, small business restructuring. Uh, so when small business restructuring was first introduced, we didn't see a huge take up. Um, I suspect during COVID again, there probably wasn't a lot of reason for people to go down this path. We've since seen it increase exponentially um, so we do, um, uh, we do get involved in terms of supporting as many of the small business restructuring requests as possible. I think the ATO usually agrees to around about 90% of those. Um, there is also an opportunity before a business puts in place their restructuring plan for the ATO to review it and provide input. Um, so that's completely voluntary from a business perspective they can submit that through ATO Online Services and get us to have a look at it um, before they submit it. Um, but yeah, certainly we have seen an exponential growth um, in terms of the numbers. And I think even more so than what's on there in the first quarter of this year, 
we've seen um, something like over 600 already this year. So we are expecting to see that curve continue to grow um, quite considerably. Um, insolvency, uh, as I think, again, has been well recorded, um, you know, Firstly, I'll say the ATO has never been the main initiator of insolvencies in terms of our legal recovery action. Um, I will, though, recognise that we are aware that once we just start our general debt collection processes, it probably does prompt businesses and individuals to be a little bit more proactive in assessing their situation. So even though we don't initiate the majority of them, we do understand that our activity probably prompts some actions in the broader environment. Um, so ATO initiated bankruptcies um, and ATO initiated wind-ups still relatively small um, when compared to the total. As I mentioned, when you map the number of, comp of businesses registered over this same period, um, the portion of insolvencies probably sits pretty stable at about 0.3% and that hasn't really shifted much. Um, so, you know, I think it is good context that certainly after a period of very, very low insolvency numbers, uh, I don't think, again, it's a surprise to see an increase because perhaps they would have flushed through as insolvency if not for that pause. We do anticipate that it will continue to increase. As I said, there's still a fair portion of our collectible debt book that we think is probably insolvent debt. Um, and so we are looking to agitate where we think we need to, to ensure that the relevant actions are undertaken. Um, but as an overall apportionment, um, we don't see it as necessarily out of pattern in terms of the number of activities that we are taking. I think we are now back up to pretty much um, the pre-COVID level. So these numbers here are just till the 31st of March. Um, more recent numbers, I think that you'll see get us back on track but I do expect that'll probably go up a little bit higher than pre-COVID as we move throughout the rest of the financial year as well. Um, one thing I will say is we have tracked also to that point of our recovery actions uh, prompt proactive insolvencies. Um, I think what we say when we look at ATO debt recovery actions within 90 days of a proactive <coughs> insolvency um, we probably sit at around one in five, one in six, where there's been ATO activity. So still the majority of um, taxpayer-initiated insolvencies happen even without one-to-one -one debt recovery action from the ATO. Um, obviously, there's been some general sentiment that the ATO is increasing, so businesses may be looking to take that action before we do in terms of debt recovery. Um, in terms of support, so I think it is important to note that for all of the recovery actions, um, for those who genuinely need it, there is still support available. Um, we do provide additional time to lodge and pay for those facing extenuating circumstances. Payment plans are available. Um, again, I think we hear quite a bit that the ATO is no longer accepting payment plans. Um, in fact, year on year on year over the last three years, we've continued to increase the number of payment plans that have been accepted. I will say we don't accept them lightly. So we do go through quite a robust process. It's incredibly important to us that the payment plan is sustainable. Um, when you have a look at the maintenance rate or kept rate, as we refer it to, pretty much within 90, 120 days, we see about 65, 70% of payment plans maintained. When you look out at 12 months, that reduces to about 45% and, uh, and below, depending on the market type. So um, we, we don't see long-term payment plans as the answer for most businesses. It's just not a viable option. Um, and we see that deterioration happen predominantly in businesses because I think of the constant new liabilities that present through their monthly or quarterly cycles. Um, so we are absolutely looking at ways to um, promote payment plans for shorter periods of time. Um, if, if we don't accept a payment plan, there's nothing stopping a business from paying. So I think the payment plan 
um, is a good way for us to recognise the engagement in the system. But in terms of recognising broader compliant engagement and effective engagement, just doing the payments as they can, even if it's not through an agreed payment plan, is still a really positive sign from our perspective that there are attempts being made to recover. Um, and we are looking at ways to be a little bit more flexible considering the circumstances in the market for payment plans. Um, sometimes we do see businesses come to us with a, a future event likely to turn them around it can be difficult for us to agree to that without a lot of evidence and if they've had previous defaults. Um, but certainly we are looking at, you know, maybe there's more for us to do in terms of interim payment plans and then reviewing and extending and things like that. But as I said, um, we really just don't see the evidence to suggest that a long, long-term payment plan is a, is a good outcome for future viability and sustainability of a business. <laughs> Um, remissions of penalties and interest. So again, we have returned to our ordinary policy settings with regards to remissions of penalties and interest. During COVID, we were extraordinarily lenient. Um, I'd say we're still lenient to some extent. Um, I think it's something like 85% of requests for interest remissions are granted still. Um, I think it's incredibly important that there's a consequence for not paying on time. Um, so what we saw as a result of remitting interest and penalties is really removing those consequences. Businesses just deprioritise payment of tax and why wouldn't you? There is no consequence of holding on to it a little bit longer. Um, so we do expect to see that continue to shift and really only be, a, be available for extenuating circumstances. Um, we do know that taxpayers and the tax professional industry in particular have become quite used to expecting that we will remit penalties and interest. We do see a lot of shopping around. You know, if I get a no, I'll ring back and I'll get a yes. Um, that does happen. Uh, but we are looking to tighten up in terms of our, our staff being more consistent with regards to those requests. Um, serious hardship. Uh, there are, of course, specific, specific support options available for taxpayers facing serious hardship. Um, for individuals, uh, that includes the release of tax debts. Um, we can place debts on hold, which essentially pauses the debt recovery action, but importantly, it doesn't remove the debt. Um, so the debt's still due and payable, and we are still required to use future refunds to pay off those debts before they're provided to the taxpayer, even when they're on hold. Um, we can assist in terms of reconstructing tax records. There is, of course, natural disaster support. Um, and there's a tax clinic program and tax help programs. Um, I think the government recently announced an expansion in terms of funding for tax clinic programs as well. Um, we also are uh, in the progress at the moment of working with advocates and partners in developing a vulnerability framework for the ATO um, and a broader vulnerability strategy in relation to debt recovery processes as well. Um, and that considers all all sorts of circumstances of vulnerability which can present in different ways at different times for different taxpayers. Um, there are also a number of things that we would encourage all businesses to have a look at. Um, we do a lot of small business education programs and develop a lot of tools. Um, certainly, you know, provisioning for taxes is a really critical and important step um, in terms of success. Uh, so, so setting up separate bank accounts um, to provision for those payments is a good idea. Um, good cash flow management habits, um, understanding where the tax obligations are coming from, when they're going to be due and how to um, anticipate those. Uh, you can do voluntary entry into pay-as-you-go instalments. Businesses can change their reporting cycles if perhaps it's more viable for them to do reporting more often. Sometimes that sounds like more of a burden we have run some pilots recently that have demonstrated that actually for some businesses when they're starting up, getting into those good habits on a monthly cycle is actually a really positive behaviour setting process for them before moving to quarterly. So it's just something to consider. Um, always keep good records and digital records we see greater success on. Um, and, you know, it's often a hard decision for businesses to make, but we do encourage businesses to always check the health and viability of their business. Um, you know, as much as possible, we're looking to support businesses 
but it isn't the ATO's role to ensure future viability of a business. Um, so it's really important that we're able to partner with businesses as best we can to support them in terms of their tax obligations, um, but it's always up to the individual business themselves to undertake those steps and make sure that they're viable. Um, specifically for small business, just wanted to share a few of the options, um, and I, I think you're going to share these slides or, or we can. So um, there is a lot of information on our ato.gov.au website, um, lots of opportunities for businesses um, in relation to how they can better um, improve uh, their methods of working and the way that they're running their business and, um, and always something that we're, we're working on improving as well. Open to questions. If anyone has any questions, I do have a microphone and we do ask that you wait for the microphone to come to you because it's even though we can hear you in the room, we need it for the recording. So I will go to Maria. Thank you, Anita. My question is actually for VBA and QBCC in the room. Um, so in light of um, talking about defaults and, and I'll say in this instance builders owing tax debt, is this something that the VBA and QBCC look at? And is it treated like, say, a money's owed complaint where um, licences could be suspended or anything like that? My short answer is yes, but you're going to take some of the content away from my next presentation, so I won't go into too much detail. Adrian, would you like to respond? Yeah, we do look at the data, but um, we don't have suspension function at the VBA for that. Um, but it is closely monitored um, to understand as now that we're getting the feed to see how that um, would impact the business. Thank you. I actually have a question for you. Hmm. Um, with collectible debt, is it the same businesses increasing their debt to you or is there more new businesses starting to owe you money? So great question. Um, in actual fact, more than half of our collectible debt is less than 12 months old. So we don't have um, really good tracking of whether or not it is the same businesses or not. Um, but I think it's often considered the case that the increase in collectible debt is debt accumulated through COVID. Um, we're not actually seeing that. So we are seeing more new debt now, it may be the same businesses that have recovered and are again in debt, but I think that's one of the reasons why we really want to undertake actions as soon as we can, because actually whilst it's less than 12 months old, that's sort of a great opportunity for us to get those businesses back on track. Um, we would probably say that by the time a debt is between two and five years old, the likelihood of that being recovered is really slim um, anything over seven years, I don't think we get much return on that at all. So we do see that the ATO has an obligation to act um, to ensure that as much as possible, whilst a business is in a position to recover, they actually have a hard look at their situation and that we do provide the support for those businesses. Excellent. I've got one more. <laughs> With regards to your DPNs and garnishes, are they effective? Um, so certainly from a DPN perspective, we do see them as very effective. Um, so we've had some pretty good recovery rates. It really depends on the circumstance of the business. So they are most effective when we do them as soon as possible. Um, what we see is when we do a DPN on a much older debt, it's more likely that the outcome is that the company goes into administration, not so much that we see payments as a result. So we do get good engagement. It's just whether or not the engagement is through payment or whether it is a disruption of trading insolvent, which is for us still an outcome, um, but we'd prefer to get in there earlier and get payment and see that company survive and, and continue to trade. That's wonderful. Everyone, please join. Oh, we do have another couple <laughs> of questions. <laughs> Would you like to go first, Michael? <laughs> Thank you. Um, given um, I note that it's still a $50 billion amount that's owed, uh, you did mention it's slowing. Do you ever see in the future where the ATO would consider um, not registering on the public record um, on, on the credit bureaus going forward? Like if the debt got back to 30 billion or something, do you ever think see the ATO reviewing their position in 
um, lodging that uh, information on the public record? Uh, not at this stage, um, mainly because that is also a really effective tool for us. So I think um, in terms of our approach, we will always respond to where we see the risk. Um, so the initial increase in terms of the number of disclosures has been on account that there was a significant pool of over 90 day, over $100,000 debts owed by businesses. Um, so I think we will see a reduced number because we just don't have that sort of stock on hand, if you like, that fit the criteria. Um, but I think it would be a sustained, really effective part of our recovery approach. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask, um, I've seen an increased number of ATO defaults, so I'm assuming that you've explored all avenues to try and get the um, person to engage with you. What happens then? Because we've got customers that are still actively trading with us, but they've got a half a million dollar ATO default hanging over them. Mm. And when we challenge them on that, they just say, it's just the ATO. You yeah. know, are you actively going to go after and then will we see a wind up in three months' time? Um, look, what I'll say is we, for us, the, there is a demand and supply issue, the same as any organisation. Um, so we, we, we don't have resources to ensure that we undertake recovery action on every single taxpayer that has a certain amount of debt um, accruing over a certain period of time. Um, we do look to take the actions where we see the greatest risk. Um, so it, it is different for different circumstances, but it's absolutely the case that we don't have enough resources to do it. Taking legal recovery is also a very expensive action for us. Um, so things like disclosure and other things like that are really useful tools because what it does is it starts to agitate in terms of the impact for a business in a different way. Um, so we're always looking <coughs> for those opportunities. You know, it, I think if you think about a business and their decisions as to which creditor they owe money to and which one they pay, probably if my power is going to go off and that's going to impact my ability to open my business doors, I'm going to pay that one first. So certainly from an ATO perspective, we're looking for what's the most um, impactful action that really prompts a business to pay attention to their tax bill. But I will say there are always going to be some that we're just not going to be able to take relevant actions on. Um, well, I suppose, as I said, if, certainly if the risk increases, we would hope that it would present in terms of a case for us to manage. Um, certainly in terms of depending on the nature of the structure, there are other um, processes that other bodies can undertake with regards to disrupting, deregistering, all of those sorts of things that the ATO doesn't, um, doesn't administer. Um, but it really depends how they present to us in terms of those, those risks. There are tip-off lines and things like that that can be presented to the ATO. So if we can't see the behaviour or it looks differently to us in terms of how that behaviour is expressed on the taxpayer account, um, there's certainly ways to sort of provide more information to say, look here, and, and to give a, a bit of a tip off to the ATO. Um, but that, those are the things that we generally rely on in terms of how we undertake actions. One more question. Um, is any part of that 50 billion owed by international organisations? And if so, has that been ramping up as well? Um, so a very small portion is owed by public and multinational businesses, which would bring in the internationals. Um, we haven't really seen that ramp up. Um, as I said, most, most public and multinational businesses, it is in their interest to pay. Probably what we see in the bigger end of town, including internationals, is um, that if their debt isn't paid, it's probably disputed debt. So the cycle for big business is that they have a liability owed, they might dispute the debt, and so it's removed from the collectible <coughs> debt book and sitting in a disputed debt book. And then out, the outcome of the dispute would either be um, that they're successful and so the liability isn't paid or not successful, in which case it's owed, and then they pay pretty quickly. <coughs> Q 
Can you hear me? Beautiful. If there's no other questions, oh, there's one more down the back. Can I just ask, with the increase in debt during COVID, was it because businesses opted to defer what they knew they had to pay or were they sort of under some illusion that they thought they were going to get away with it, like it was just going to go away? Um, I think it's a combination of a few things. So I'd say that there were probably quite a few businesses that before various stimulus measures were on offer were probably close to non-viable. They might have got prop propped back up due to stimulus um, and, and perhaps falsely thought that they then were viable, but they weren't. Um, the second thing is that there were absolutely businesses that walked away but didn't tell us. So it feels and looks like collectible debt. It's probably not collectible debt because they've closed down, they're not viable. Um, we absolutely saw an increase in businesses who had the capacity to pay, choose not to. So there is absolutely a shift in what we would consider broader payment culture, which said on account of the ATO not taking action and there being no consequence for me delaying payment, um, I'm going to deprioritise payment of tax. Um, and so that's a lot of the shift and payment increase that we've seen has probably been those businesses going, yeah, okay, now I'll pay. Um, I, I will say that even the what we hear from our staff who are on the front line making the phone calls, we're seeing a number of businesses come and ask us for a payment plan. Um, when that's denied because it looks like they can pay now, they pay. So there is also a behaviour that sort of says, I'm going to try and pay this over time. I don't really need to. I've got the money there. I can pay it, but I'm going to ask to see what I can get. Um, we've seen a really significant number of businesses then realise when we question that, oh, no, I've actually got to pay this and they're well and truly able to make those payments. Okay, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Anita. That was a very um, insightful and thought-provoking presentation. Um, there's a lot of information for us to all try and gather. Thank you. If everyone can please join me in thanking Anita for her time. Thank you.